The first industrial revolution happened in the 18th century, using water and steam power to mechanize production. The second industrial revolution used electricity to create mass production. And the third used electricity and information technology to automate production. Now there is a fourth industrial revolution that is causing a huge upheaval in almost every industry worldwide. We sought out someone at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution and met Dr. Ajay Gopal, president and CEO of ANSYS Incorporated, a world-renowned Western Pennsylvania company that produces engineering simulation software. I talked with Dr. Gopal about the depth and breadth of the changes this will bring to our everyday way of life. Dr. Ajay Gopal, welcome to Primal Interviews. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. The Germans are calling it Industry 4.0. Why is this being called the fourth industrial revolution? Well, if you go back in history, um, the first industrial revolution was essentially categorized by, by the use of machines, uh, automating factories. Uh, and that, of course, created an enormous amount of wealth as, as in industry started to take over the economy. Uh, the second industrial revolution was essentially the mass use of electricity, moving away from steam and other sources of power. The third industrial revolution is essentially the information age. That's when uh, computers started to come into the economy, uh, and of course we today are seeing the fruits of that. And the fourth industrial age, or well, the fourth industrial revolution, is being driven by the combination of digital technologies into the physical world. It's essentially products that were previously made of cast iron, making those smart. It's about the Internet of Things. It's about smart machines. It's about smart buildings. It's about improving medical care through the use of digital technologies into techniques that were previously just ordinary techniques. Has the old production model of man, animal, man, machine become the man, cybernetic relationship of today? Describe the evolution there. So when you think about this digital revolution that we talked about, Industry 4.0, manufacturing itself now changes. The, 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 our, our economy, the world we know today, evolved from people producing things uh, at, at, as artisans. So things were produced on an individual basis. And then, of course, we reached the, the, the era of mass production uh, and, of course, mass consumption to go with that. Well, as we go forward with the use of digital technologies in manufacturing techniques, we can get to the era of mass customization. So yes, we will get the benefits of mass production, but we will be able to produce objects or products that are targeted for you, specifically for you, for your needs. Let's take, for example, an artificial knee. That's something that's produced right now. You'll get a certain set of sizes. And when you have surgery, the knee gets put into your body, and if you happen to be on exactly that size, it's perfect for you. But if you're in between sizes, the surgeon has to either pick the size that's a little bit small for you or a little bit large for you and kind of get your need to adjust to that. Well, in the future, if you use different manufacturing technologies, for example, with additive manufacturing, you could, or 3D printing, you could print an artificial knee that's completely appropriate for you based on the geometry of your body. And so it fits perfectly. And if you're a 25-year-old man in prime condition, maybe you need a very robust knee because even though you're a particular size, you need something that's very strong. It's going to last you the rest of your life. But if you're an 85-year-old man who's perhaps not as active, same size, and maybe it can be a little bit lighter because it's more important for comfort. And so you can start to imagine that based on exactly who you are, what your stage of life is, what your physical condition is, medical implants could be adjusted and built exactly for you. And that's just one example. In every single case, you could imagine coming into a, into a factory or coming to a manufacturer and say, you know, I want that product, but I want it customized for me in the following ways. And with digital technology integrated into the manufacturing process, it makes it happen. What are the social implications of the use of this technology in the real world? It's amazing. In the last few years, with the, with the convenience of digital technologies, everyone has an expectation that they will get exactly the product that they expect. Um, you buy, a, you buy a, a computer, you buy a, you buy a mobile device, you'll customize the home, home page, it'll look exactly like what you want it to look at, you'll look at your screen, you'll download the apps that you want. The device is yours. It isn't exactly the device that was sold to you. What was sold to you was a platform that you customized and made it yours. That's what people expect. 
And, and in the future, it won't just be about these kinds of computer devices. It'll be about everything. Every single device, everything that you work with, we are reaching the era when you can get it customized for you. It will be yours. It'll be to your specification. And that's enabled because manufacturing techniques, product manufacturers, people who build these things, want to be in a position to give you that flexibility, and they do so using digital technologies being integrated into traditional processes. And that's really the essence of Industry 4.0. Can you give us some examples of how the process works with regard to simulation technology? So what we do is we help customers, our customers who build products, we help uh, their engineers build better products. Right? So engineers are always asking questions. How do I make a better product? How do I make it faster? How do I make it safer? Um, how do I bring the innovation that's in my head? How do I bring it to market sooner? Our solutions help, uh, help those customers do that. And the way we do it is through engineering simulation software. So we can help a customer imagine their entire product completely within the computer. A physical product, you can imagine it completely within the computer, you can instantiate it within the computer, and you can test its behavior within the computer. So you'll know how the product is going to perform in real life without the need to build a physical prototype, without the need to do physical experimentation. It can be done completely digitally. And these can be very simple products. We've been used by customers to figure out the coating on candy, the optimal coating on candy. Uh, but we're also being used by customers for autonomous vehicles, for aircraft. Uh, we're being used uh, across all kinds of wide variety, semiconductors, a wide variety of technology, products and capabilities. And so it's very much about taking the guesswork that you might have in building a product, taking that out and putting it into a rigid discipline where the computer helps the engineer navigate the complexity of building these next generation products. They say that a, a car battery, the, the life of a car battery is three to five years and usually people don't know that it's time to change the battery until one day they're sitting in a parking lot and they try to start their car and they're not going anywhere it's time to get a new battery, but they have to call AAA because they weren't anticipating that that was going to happen. So what you're saying is this new technology is like having an entity that will tell you, you know, Paul, it's time to get that battery changed because it's getting low and there may come a day when the car doesn't start anymore. That's a great way to think about it. But you could also imagine now extending that. And, and now thinking about your driving uh, habits, for example. So now when you get, uh, it, it isn't about how many times you cross the yellow lane, for example. It might be when you cross the lane and in what traffic conditions you did. So if the, if the car was able to analyze the traffic conditions around you and give you feedback when you're driving, that would be helpful. And of course, in the future, as you start to think about a world in which you have autonomous vehicles, when human beings now are able to rely on the technology to be able to drive themselves, that opens up a whole new uh, avenue. Now you have an opportunity for mobility uh, being made available to people who today are cut out, to, to older people, for example, who may not be able to drive anymore, or to young people who don't have a driver's license. And so the, as you start to imagine the integration of digital technologies into the automotive, as you just, as you just suggested, you, you're opening up this, this complete transformation of the industry that I think is, is, is the direction that the industry is going in right now. And certainly you hear about it in the, in the press. There is, of course, the fear that some insidious entity could hack into the computer and suddenly take you for a ride that you don't necessarily want to go on. What are the things that are in place that can prevent that from happening? Well, I, I think it's, it's clearly the case that with any time you have a piece of digital equipment uh, that is connected to a network, there is an opportunity or there is a possibility for the bad guys to get in and take advantage of that uh, and to exploit that. And so it's up to the manufacturers to make sure that when they build their systems, they put in all of the safety uh, and the security safeguards that will prevent that from happening. And of course, the, the world of cybersecurity continues to be a, uh, a spy versus spy world where where you know, one side comes up with, with uh, attacks and then countermeasures and then more attacks and more countermeasures. It's an, it's an ever escalating world uh, and it's obviously the case that every manufacturer who's producing an internet connected object has to be responsible in the way that they, that they build their, bring their products to market. But it's more than just the cybersecurity. That's also important. But it's also making sure that you do the safety analysis and you make sure that when you have a self-driving car, 
it responds correctly in the right set of circumstances. One of the CEOs of a major company said that it's going to take something like 8 billion miles of road tests, 8B with a billion mm -hmm. miles of road tests to certify self-driving cars. Uh, and of course that's not going to be possible using human drivers, it's going to take a lot of years. And so that means you have to rely on computer simulations to be able to help figure out that the, that the cars are actually going to work effectively. But when you think about the statistic of automotive accidents today, I believe the statistic is something like 90% of accidents caused because of human error. So the system as it is today also does have, uh, it does have some um, weak links, and the weak link is the driver. Uh, and to the extent that we can assist the driver to begin with, we can make it easier for the driver and help the driver be more effective and respond more rapidly, that puts us on a path uh, towards full automation if it does make sense. As with any advanced technology at any point in history, there's always the concern about where do human beings factor into all of this. What are the opportunities, particularly when it comes to job opportunities for people in the future? I'm a believer that with new technology uh, comes new opportunities. Uh, and of course, we as a society have to make sure that uh, we can train people to take advantage of these new technologies. And you see this in schools today. I mean, when I grew up, uh, and I was in high school, I mean, I didn't even know what a computer was. And, and of course, you know, my kids grew up taking laptops to school and now, you know, grade schoolers are playing with uh, mobile devices and they're using them in school in the educational context. Robotics is a great example, right? I, I didn't really understand what engineering was uh, until I was in college as an un engineering undergraduate. But today in grade school, p kids are playing around with, with uh, robotic solutions and they're understanding the joy that comes from putting things together and seeing them actually do interesting things. And that's, that's phenomenal. So we are training kids today in different, with different uh, techniques, with new ideas, with new skills. Uh, and I think it's important as we think about this Industry 4.0 to recognize that it will require, um, uh, will, it will require thought and analysis. It will require education uh, in STEM, uh, in the STEM disciplines, for example, uh, as we start to move forward. Could anything go wrong with such a, a virtual understanding of the world? I think of the sort of 2001-ish, Stanley Kubrick-ish nightmare scenario in which the robots are taking over and humans are no longer making decisions for themselves. Well, the thing to realize is, is none of these things are like turning on a light switch. It isn't as though one morning you come in and you say, okay, well, we're here we are, it's Industry 4.0, it's a completely brand new world, and everything has changed. That never happens. Changes happen incrementally. Uh, uh, digital technologies evolve incrementally. Um, uh, manufacturing techniques evolve in incrementally. We talked about autonomous vehicles. It's evolving incrementally. Everything evolves incrementally. And then when enough incremental changes happen, at some point you'll find yourself in a situation where um, you take for granted that you'll have smart products surrounding you. There's plenty of time as we think about these, these evolutions. There's a natural uh, governance mechanism in every technological advance that determines whether technologies will be successful or will fail. Uh, and um, uh, you see this, for example, with digital technologies today. Uh, people will launch products, products will be successful, or they won't be successful. And if they're not successful, they fade away into the ash, ash heap of history. And if they are successful, people will embrace them. Uh, you see this with mobile apps, for example, in the consumer space. Uh, you see this with products that are released in the market. You see this with car designs. You'll see this with everything, car safety features. So over time, there's the natural self-selecting process of what's important, what doesn't make sense, that, that, that will propel the technologies, the market needs that people have today will propel them forward. Uh, and those are the technologies and those are the solutions that will win. How can a new labor force adapt or be trained to be an integral part of this new industry? The computer revolution uh, that started 50 years ago, uh, but certainly has continued to increase uh, in terms of rate and pace, that's created a set of um, imperatives on our education system to train people to be uh, computer savvy, to be knowledge workers, to take advantage of that. Essentially, with Industry 4.0, it really is the incorporation of digital technologies that, ca that came about in the last revolution, the Industrial Revolution, uh, the information age, uh, the digital technologies into the physical world. So in some sense, many of the skills that are needed 
STEM skills, math, etc., are no different in the future than they were in the past. That's what we need as the basis of our, for an educated workforce. Uh, and, and, and then it's a question of how the technology continues to evolve uh, and, um, and how it gets used. One of the priorities with new and emerging technologies is efficiency, cost savings, energy savings. How does this contribute to those goals? Um, in, in, in the area of, of sort of around the house, uh, we work with a company called Nibia, which is a startup company. And um, they had a very interesting problem. They said, well, look, you know, a shower, a regular shower, can be very inefficient of water usage, uh, and especially areas of drought, or certainly in areas or in locations like health clubs where lots of people are showering. You, there's an enormous amount of water could be wasted. So can we come up with a better shower? I mean, it seems like a very studied problem, but the, but the problem's pretty challenging because if you say, how do I reduce the amount of water it's, that's consumed by a shower, it turns out if you make the droplets smaller, then the, 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 drops get, the droplets get really cold by the time they reach your skin. So what was supposed to be a nice warm shower after a workout, for example, becomes a cold bath and it's not very fun. So they were trying to solve the problem of how do we reduce water consumption and how do we still give the person taking the shower a pleasant experience? And they used our technology and they came up with some very innovative designs and it's now commercially available. What they've essentially done is they've replaced the shower head with a device that produces a very fine mist. But the shape of the nozzles in the shower has been optimized so by the time the water hits your body, it hasn't cooled down. That mist is still warm. So imagine standing under a nice warm waterfall. That's the experience. This is a team a startup company just looking at a problem with fresh eyes, using simulation technology, and coming up with a completely amazing solution that addresses what the original objective was and has an amazing user experience. The end user, the customer, gets the experience they're looking for and more. They have an outstanding experience, and the objectives that we have, saving water, saving lives, those experiences, those objectives also uh, are fulfilled. Dr. Ajay Gopal, thanks for being our guest on Primal Interviews. Thank you so much for the, for the conversation. I really enjoyed it.